Hello, everybody. How are you today? And I'm here today with Jacob and Jed. We're going on with the Theotetus. So we've seen here Socrates showing off his skills. He gave us a very impressive presentation of what materialism is, relativism. He then knocked it down. Now he's going to build it up again. Let me make this large. And we are on page 87 in the text. As always, we are using the Loeb translation. And for those of you who do not have the text, there's a link for it in the description box. So we're picking it up here where he's going, where Socrates says, then what can knowledge be? So they're starting all over again. Um, before we jump into the text, do either of you have any questions or comments about last, what we've read so far? Not just last week, but anything in the text. Not I. Okay. Okay. Great. Then we'll jump on into it then. Uh, Jacob, would you be willing to read Socrates this time? Sure. Okay. Thank you. Then what can knowledge be? We must apparently begin our discussion all over again. And yet, Theotetus, what are we on the point of doing? About what? It seems to me that we are behaving like a worthless gamecock. Before winning the victory, we have leapt away from our argument and begun to crow. How so? We seem to be acting like professional debaters. We have based our agreements on the mere similarity of words and are satisfied to have got the better of the argument in such a way and we do not see that we, who claim to be not contestants for a prize, but lovers of wisdom, are doing just what those ingenious persons do. I do not yet understand what you mean. Well, I will try to make my thought clear. We asked you to, or we asked, you, you recollect whether a man who has learned something and remembers it does not know it. We showed first that the one who has seen and then shuts his eyes remembers, although he does not see. And then we showed that he does not know, although at the same time he remembers. But this, we said, was impossible. And so the Pythagorean tale was brought to naught and yours also about the identity of knowledge and perception. Evidently. It would not be so, I fancy, my friend, if the father of the first of the two tales were alive. He would have had a great deal to say in its defense. But he is dead, and we are abusing the orphan. Why, even the guardians whom Protagoras left, one of whom is Theodorus here, are unwilling to come to the child, child assistance. So it seems that we shall have to do it ourselves, assisting him in the name of justice. Do so, for it is not I, Socrates, but rather Callias, the son of Hipp Hipponicus, who is the guardian of his children. As for me, I turned rather too soon from abstract speculations to geometry. However, I shall be grateful to you if you come to his assistance. Good, Theodorus. Now, see how I shall help him, for a man might find himself involved in still worse inconsistencies than those in which we found ourselves just now, if he did not pay attention to the terms which we generally use in assent and denial. So, shall I explain this to you, or only to Theotetus? Before we go on here, I just want to point out here that what Theodorus then was confirming is that he did indeed study with Protagoras, although he tells us that he turned rather soon from philosophy to doing geometry. Okay, so now we have a little bit more of his background. And as for who to explain it to, he says, to both of us, but let the younger answer, for he will be less disgraced if he is discomfited. So we see again, he's hesitant to participate. Very well. 
Now I'm going to ask the most frightfully difficult question of all. It runs, I believe, something like this. Is it possible for a person, if he knows a thing, at the same time not to know that which he knows? Now then, what shall we answer, Theotetus? Hmm. It is impossible, I should think. Not if you make seeing and knowing identical. For what will you do with a question from which there is no escape, by which you are, as the saying is, caught in a pit, when your adversary, unabashed, puts his hand over one of your eyes and asks if you see his cloak with the eye that is covered? I shall say, I think, not with that eye, but with the other. Then you do see and do not see the same thing at the same time? After a fashion. That, he will reply, is not at all what I want, and I did not ask about the fashion, but whether you know, whether you both know and do not know the same thing. Now, manifestly, you see that which you do not see, but you have agreed that seeing is, knowledge, is knowing, and not seeing is not knowing. Very well. From all this, reckon out what the result is. Well, I reckon out that the result is the contrary of my hypothesis. And perhaps, my fine fellow, more troubles of the same sort might have come upon you, if anyone asks you further questions, whether it is possible to know the same thing both sharply and dully, to know close at hand, but not at a distance, to know both violently and gently, and countless other questions, such as a nimble fighter, fighting for pay in the war of words, might have lain in wait and asked you, when you said that knowledge and perception were the same thing, he would have charged down upon hearing and smelling and such senses, and would have argued persistently and unceasingly until you were filled with admiration of his greatly desired wisdom, and were taken in his toils, and then, after subduing and binding you, he would at once proceed to bargain with you for such ransom as it might be agreed upon between you. What argument, then, you might ask, will Protagoras produce to strengthen his forces? Shall we try to carry on the discussion? By all means. He will, I fancy, say all that we have said in his defense, and then will close with us, saying contemptuously, Our estimable... estimable... <laughs> Socrates here frightened a little boy by asking if it were possible for one and the same person to remember and at the same time not to know one thing and the same thing. And when the child in his fright said no, because he could not foresee what would result, Socrates made poor me a laughing stock in his talk. But you sl slovenly, Socrates, the fact thus stand, when you examine any doctrine of mine by the method of questioning, if the person who is questioned makes such replies as I should make and comes to grief, then I am refuted. But if, if his replies are quite different, then the person questioned is refuted, not I. Take this example. Do you expose you could... Or do you suppose you could get anybody to admit that the memory a man has of a past feeling he no longer feels is anything like the feeling at the time when he was feeling it? Far from it. Or that he would refuse to admit that it is possible for one and the same person to know and not to know one and the same thing. Or, if he were afraid to admit this, would he ever admit that a person who has become unlike is the same as before he became unlike? In fact, if we are to be on our own guard against such verbal entanglements, would he admit that a person is one at all and not many? 
who become infinite in number if the process of becoming different continues. But, my dear fellow, he will say, attack my real doctrines in a more generous manner and prove, if you can, that perceptions, when they come or become to each of us, are not individual, or that, if they are individual, what appears to each one would not, for all that, become to that one alone, or, if you prefer to say, be, would not be, to whom it appears. But when you talk of pigs and dog-faced baboons, you not only act like a pig yourself, but you persuade your hearers to act so towards my writings. And that is not right. For I maintain that the truth is as I have written. Each one of us is the measure of the things that are and those that are not. But each person differs immeasurably from every other in just this, that to one person some things appear and are, and to another person other things. And I do not by any means say that wisdom and the wise man do not exist. On the contrary, I say that if bad things appear and are to any one of us, precisely that man is wise who causes a change and makes good things appear and be to him. And moreover, do not lay too much stress upon the words of my argument, but get a clearer understanding of my meaning from what I am going to say. Recall to your mind what was said before that his food appears and is bitter to the sick man, but appears and is the opposite of bitter to the man in health. Now, neither of these two is to be made wiser than he is. That is not possible. Nor should the claim be made that the sick man is ignorant because his opinions are ignorant, or the healthy man wise because his are different. But a change must be made from the one condition to the other, for the other is better. So too, in education, a change has to be made from a worse to a better condition. But the physician causes the change by means of drugs, and the teacher of wisdom by means of words. And yet, in fact, no one ever made anyone think truly who previously thought falsely since it is impossible to think that which is not, or to think any other things than those which one feels. And these are always true. But I believe that a man who, on account of a bad condition of soul, thinks thoughts akin to that condition, is made by a good condition of, a, of soul to think correspondingly good thoughts. And some men, through inexperience, call these appearances true whereas I call them better than others, but in no, in no wise truer. And the wise, my dear Socrates, I do not by any means call tadpoles. When they have to do with the human body, I call them physicians. And when they have to do with plants, husbandmen. For I assert that these latter, when plants are sickly, instill them into good and healthy sensations and true ones instead of bad sensations and that the wise and good orators make the good instead of the evil seem to be right to their states for i claim that whatever seems right and honorable to a state is really right and honorable to it so long as it believes it to be so but the wise man causes the good instead of that which is evil to them in each instance, to be and seem right and honorable. And on the same principle, the teacher who is able to train his pupils in this manner is not only wise, but is also entitled to receive high pay from them when their education is finished. And in this sense, it is true that some men are wiser than others, and that no one thinks falsely, and that you, whether you will or no, or, or no, must endure to be a measure. Upon these positions... Pause, right. Let's pause oh, for sure. a moment. 
So thank mm-hmm. you for reading all that. It was quite long. Um, I'll give you a break here. So let's pause and make sure we understand what his position is. So what is his defense against all of the arguments that Socrates gave before? That if you're sick, it's different. Your taste buds are different than when you're healthy. Or if you close one eye and one eye is open, you're seeing and not seeing. When you hear a foreign language, do you know it because you're perceiving it? So there were all these different arguments that we saw in the last two weeks. What is Protagoras's um, or potentially Protagoras's um, defense here. Socrates in the form of Protagoras. So let's go back. He says that a man is wise, that man is wise who causes a change and makes good things appear and be to him. And so the doctor is wiser than the patient and the teacher is wise and makes the students wise. And he throws in there that he deserves a lot of money for doing that. What do you think of these arguments? Jed, what are your thoughts? So all of this is Socrates defending the idea that perception is knowledge in the voice of Protagoras. Yes, exactly. And I I don't understand his defense. Maybe Jacob does. Well, it's tough to maintain this position, but I think he's, you know, saying, you know, only in your ability to, like, you know, grow out of your ignorance, are you able to, you know, actually have knowledge? But he does say, like, you, you know, people that were false... Yeah, no one ever made anyone think truly who previously thought falsely. Since it is impossible to change. So I'm trying to like reconcile that statement with like knowledge. Back up here. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. He wants to say that the teacher is wiser for being in a better state, but the student who had who thought differently before is somehow not wrong because you feel that way. Therefore it's true for you. Yeah. It's a difficult position. We can see it with the body, you know, when you're healthy versus when you're sick, it's very clear. I don't think there's a whole lot of disagreement about that. When it comes to the state of the soul or the mind, um, Everybody seems to think they're the healthy one and the wise one. Right, so it's not quite right. clear how he's measuring that. You're right. Yeah, because anyone who's a teacher mm-hmm. was once was at one time a student. So <laughs> he's saying like your soul, you get like a new soul, I guess, or something like because your soul can't really like change. <laughs> yeah. Or made better. Yeah. But then who's measuring what it, you know what qualifies you to be the teacher? Right. The title alone doesn't make you the wise one. So mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. he started off by saying, um, if you're saying um, man is the measure of all things and therefore pigs and dog face baboons are measures, you are a pig yourself because his true position is that everyone is wise on account that what they are experiencing is happening for them but a higher wisdom is the ability to make others 
believe your perception? Now you're bringing in persuasion, and that was not here in the argument. A wise person is somebody who brings them into a better state of mind, a, yeah. uh, more wisdom. But his position is wisdom is based on your own experience and perception. So you're bringing them, if you can bring somebody to your point of view, you are in fact more wise. And you get money. Right. Like, like when he says about like the husbandman, like mm. you're wise because you, you know, were able to make these plants have a good sensation or like truer sensations. So you can't change people's knowledge. You just change what they are sensing. Yes, right. But that would there, you... that would also mean that um, if the greater wisdom is the one who is able to bring another to a better state. Therefore, that's what wisdom is, being able to bring another. Then what you're bringing them to would be the ability to bring others to their position. So you, you are a good teacher by making others see what you see or believe what you see. That is, wisdom is making others believe what you see. Yeah, keep going back to this quote here. That man is wise who causes a change and makes good things appear to be to him. It doesn't necessarily mean that you're, you're bringing someone else. That is the position of the sophist. That's what they do. Um, but if you bring yourself to that better condition, then you've earned for yourself the title wise, according to this quote. And so far, all we've got that distinguishes a better from a worse is the ability mm -hmm. to bring somebody to mm -hmm. something. Yeah. yeah, it causes a change. It doesn't say to whom, to yourself, to someone else. It could apply to both. And we but haven't yeah. defined what the good change is yet, have we? Mm -hmm. Right, that, that's the question mark because, again, with body, we may be... Clearly, having an illness is bad for the body, whereas healthy condition, we may have some disagreements of, you know, how healthy do you have to be? Where do you draw the line there? Um, but certainly we can agree that illness is worse and being in a state without illness is a better condition. When it comes to the mind or the soul, I think there's more disagreement and more difficulty in deciding um, where to draw the line. But yeah, that's the position so far. So just making sure that we are all on the same page here. And now he's going to go on where he says, upon these positions. And Jacob, you read a lot there. Do you want to switch with Jed? Or do you want to keep, keep going? Okay, great. That's all right. Okay. So then upon we'll these... Mm. Oh. Please go ahead. Gotcha. Sure. <laughs> Upon these positions, my doctrine stands firm, and if you can dispute it in principle, dispute it by bringing an opposing doctrine against it. Or, if you prefer the method of questions, ask questions, for an intelligent person ought not to reject this method. On the contrary, he should choose it before all others. However, let me make a suggestion. Do not be unfair in your questioning. It is very inconsistent for a man who asserts that he cares for virtue to be constantly unfair in discussion. And it is unfair in discussion when a man makes no distinction between merely trying to make points and carrying on a real argument. In the former, he may jest and try to trip up his opponent as much as he can. But in real argument, he must be in earnest and must set his interlocutor on his feet, pointing out to him those slips only which are due to himself and his previous associations. For if you act in this way, those who debate with you will cast the blame for their confusion and perplexity upon themselves, not upon you. 
and they will run after you and love you, and they will hate themselves and run away from themselves, taking refuge in philosophy, and uh, that they may escape from their former selves by becoming different. But if you act in the opposite way, as most teachers do, you'll produce the opposite results, and instead of making your young associates philosophers, you will make them hate philosophy when they grow older. If, therefore, you will accept the suggestion which I made before, you will avoid a hostile and combative attitude, and in a gracious spirit will enter the lists with me and inquire what we really mean when we declare that all things are in motion, and that whatever seems is to each individual, whether man or state. And on the basis of that, you will consider the question whether knowledge and perception are the same or different, instead of doing as you did a while ago, using as your basis the ordinary meaning of names and words, which most people pervert in haphazard ways and thereby cause all sorts of perplexity in one another. Such, Theodorus, is the help I have furnished your friend to the best of my ability. Not much, for my resources are small, but if he were living himself, he would have helped his offspring in a fashion more magnificent. Thank you. And before we go on then, let's go back and look over this last part here, because now he gave what he sees as the rules of discussion. What do you think of his rules? He said you have to ask questions or propose alternate theories. Can't just criticize his, his theory. <laughs> What do you think of that? Uh, <laughs> sounds nice. Um, if you understand someone's theory, then I guess you don't have to ask any questions about it. And, you know, if you don't know the answer yourself, but you know that the theory is is wrong, you should still be able to say that the theory is wrong. Right. You can see holes in the argument without necessarily, without necessarily knowing um, what the correct alternative is. Mm. Mm. Good. Yeah. Anything else, Jed? Anything you see there? So the rules are... Um, not to do what you just say, not to point out there are holes in the argument, but to present an alternative position. Because everything is in motion, and whatever is true is what, whatever is true and honourable is what appears to you. So it's no good just taking away. You have to present something in the motion of experience upon which they can have a truth. Give them something. Because that's where knowledge comes from, what we experience. Which is interesting because um, I guess this ties in with the idea that there is nothing beyond our experience of motion, the experiencer, the experience, and the thing you're experiencing. It's from that dynamic. There's nothing else. There's nothing within you you can draw out. You either have experienced it and that's your truth or you haven't. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the idea of asking questions as a midwife wouldn't make any sense. You, you give someone something. I want to stick to the... Let's try to stick a little closer to the text here. So he says, for example, it's unfair in discussion when a man makes no distinction between merely trying to make points and carrying on a real argument. And then to describe that, he says in the former, just making points, it means you jest and try to trip up the opponent as much as you can. His idea of carrying on a real argument is you must be in earnest and must set, set the interlocutor on his feet, pointing out to him those slips only 
which are due to himself and his previous associations. What does that sound like? Go ahead, Jacob. Hmm. Yeah, uh, as I just say, it's, it's only to clear up your misunderstandings. You know, you, you're supposed to kind of take what they're saying, you know, as the hmm. truth, and then on, only try to clear up your misunderstandings of, of that theory. Right, because if what you're saying is true, then if I don't understand it or don't agree with it, it's because I have something false in me, which doesn't actually fit the theory. Is it your experience that um, relativists don't seem to have any difficulty telling you that you're wrong? They only become relativists when you tell them that they're wrong. That seems to be what he's doing here. Um, and then in the part that's in yellow there, that sounds very much like midwifery, actually. Um, in true midwifery, this sounds good on the surface because it does fit philosophy as we, we use it and we practice it. Um, when people can see their own errors, then they will be grateful for having seen that. So he's playing teacher. He wants to play the role of the midwife, it sounds like. That's what, pro, or at least the way Socrates is presenting Protagoras here. He's playing the role of the teacher who's assuming that he's right and he's going to help other people see their own errors. And then they will be grateful. And it's very easy for this to sound good to us because this is the role Socrates plays, right? In fact, that's the role he's playing in this whole dialogue as the midwife. By testing Theotetus, he's helping Theotetus see his own errors. And those who appreciate Socrates do follow him. They do run after him and love him. Right. Do you see the parallels between the way Socrates actually functioned and the way Protagoras is talking? Right, because Socrates, when he's talking to Theotetus, like, mm -hmm. you know, assumes perception is reality mm -hmm. earnestly, but then, run, you know, just runs into problems because of his misunderstanding of, of taking that to be true. Yeah. So yeah, see, that's yeah. I didn't think of that. The parallel between mm -hmm. what Socrates is actually doing. Mm -hmm. And then what he says here is that in the former, what he's accusing Socrates of doing is trying to trip him up as much as he can. So when you find faults in Protagoras's argument, well, then you're doing this because Protagoras is always right. And if you do that, then you make them hate philosophy. Don't tell people they're wrong. Find the errors in yourself and never correct anybody else. That's basically what the whole argument comes down to. Although it sounds very um, intellectual, the way he presents it, it sounds very mature and intellectual. This is the proper way to argue. It sounds really bad, of course, to try to trip people up. And we can imagine, you know, we all know people like that who do that sort of game. And there are people, of course, who use, um, who try to do dialectic or try to do like philosoph, um, like Socrates' style questioning in a more combative way. There is an immature way, of course, to do it. You want to avoid the combative attitude and you want a more grace, gracious spirit. And of course, you can um, have discussions as, as Socrates does in a more gracious way. And you can, and there is a childish version of it that is combative. So I think that that little speech there, when you're first reading it, maybe you're thinking of those immature people 
right? And you can side with Protagoras because you're imagining those people as the ones that he's thinking of. But when you realize that his argument would even apply to Socrates, and we see what Socrates is really doing, it's, it's different from what Protagoras is describing here. Then I think the speech takes on a different tone. Now, that's, that's my take. What, what do you guys think? Maybe I'm saying too much. Why don't, why don't you guys jump in? Well, it sounded like he said um, on page 99, uh, he must be in earnest and set his interlocutor on his feet, pointing out to him those slips which are due to himself and his previous associations. Mm -hmm. So you point out where the person you're talking to is wrong and his friends are wrong. And that way, um, those who debate you will cast the blame for their confusion and perplexity on themselves. So he's saying, when you talk with somebody, you point out where they're wrong in their associations, so they won't think that you're making any mistakes. But then right before that, he said, don't do that. So what do you think of that? It doesn't make sense. <laughs> yeah, and like maybe it hinges on the word himself because they're both men in this example and it's not really clear if he's saying that when you debate, when you have this kind of discussion, do you somebody so like Protagoras gives you his argument and you want to counter it, do you only point out to him those things that are due to himself, meaning Protagoras? Do you point out those errors, which is what I think Socrates was actually doing? Or does it mean, as we were suggesting here, that you look at yourself? And you can only find your own ears or only ask questions that are due to that. It's not really clear the way it's worded here. So he's saying when you started... Oh, slips, oh, right. hmm, perhaps it is Protagoras because those slips. So when you hear the argument, if you hear something that sounds wrong and you think it's due to Protagoras having an error in himself, you can point that out. Only he calls that jesting, as you've pointed out here, that um, he contradicts himself. Because he said you're jesting if you do that. Or at least he interpreted Socrates. There really says, this is a kind of a confusing thing here, but Protagoras, of course, is actually Socrates in the voice of Protagoras. But what he, what, Socrates is imagining Protagoras doing is interpreting him as jesting when Socrates is actually finding false beliefs in him. And finding false beliefs, by the way, in Theodorus and Theotetus because of their previous associations with Protagoras. Theodorus was a student of Protagoras, and now Theotetus is a student of Theodorus. So he's saying, if you correct me, you're being a jester. And if you agree with any everything I say, and only look at yourself and your own mistakes, and never question me, the great wise Noah, then you've got virtue, and people will join the philosophy that way then you will appreciate Protagoras. You're going to run after him and love him and Where take refuge in, in philosophy. Mm -hmm. So if you are Which only, so if you never question your teacher mm -hmm. and you only look at your own mistakes, then those who debate with you will cast the blame for their confusion on themselves. So they'll imitate you. So if you go around saying that I was always wrong 
and because I didn't agree with uh, Protagoras, then others will imitate you and reflect on their own selves and join philosophy. This sounds like a mar multi-level marketing guy. <laughs> but it sure sounded good, huh? No, not to me. It didn't make any sense. Oh. Let's jump to the end of the speech here. Um, he says, on the basis of that, you will consider the question whether knowledge and perception are the same or different instead of doing as you did a while ago. So here's what Socrates did a while ago, using as your basis the ordinary meaning of names and words, which most people pervert in haphazard ways and thereby cause all sorts of perplexity in one another. Well, much of philosophy is about defining words, isn't it? Do you agree with this? More or less, did, yeah. Did Socrates do this? Use the ordinary meaning of names and words instead of using what the special way of using them? What what words do you think Socrates changed the meaning of or didn't understand correctly? What are you seeing here? You both have little grins. You're seeing something. My cat's being annoying, but <laughs> <laughs> I don't have a cat to, to pet to get out of this question. So. Uh, okay. So how is um, Protagoras defining true and false? Is it different from the way Socrates is defining true and false? Yeah, I mean, Protagoras, truth is much more commonplace. Uh, false falseness is. I don't even. I don't even know how you can be false. How you can be wrong in Protagoras's mm -hmm. doctrine. Okay. The ordinary meaning of false means incorrect. But for Protagoras, does false have a different meaning? Certainly. Mm. That which doesn't agree with him? So it seems that a person can um, disagree with the teacher. A student can disagree with the teacher, but the student is still not wrong. It's still not false, right? According to this theory, because it's always true if it's true for you. It's just somehow the teacher has a, a better truth or something. So you have to use these very creative definitions of words in order for Protagoras's argument to hold. I think uh, the confusions you're both having with the argument are precisely on this point here, that we're using the ordinary meaning of words. We're using their dictionary definition, whereas he's doing something else. You know what? I just got it. <laughs> This is, this is, this is the guy, this is the guy that like 90% of our world is. They say, look, um, it's all common sense. Get any goddamn politician on TV. They'll say, well, all of these people who disagree with me are just using their fancy words from their ivory tower. I'm just a small, ignore the fact that I went to Harvard or Princeton. I'm just a small city folk. And, and it's just common sense. It's the ordinary meaning of things. Everybody knows the truth, including you. So you're just as wise as anyone else. So that's appealing. So I'm getting you to vote for me. I'm getting you to join my religion. Because these people who, who debate about the meaning of words, ah, they're wrong. It's obvious. It's obvious. It's common sense. And you know what? Whatever you feel is true, that's the best you're just as wise as everybody else except of course for me because i'm the priest or the preacher or the pastor or the politician and 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 i i'm the one who has a little bit more i'm closer to jesus or mm. or closer to the constitution so i have my my truth is a little bit better but your your truth and your rights i will fight for 
and anything else is just not common sense, is not ordinary, and is just talking about the meaning of words which doesn't go anywhere. You got it. Yes. And go out and tell other people and they'll be like you and they'll join their marketing, multi-level marketing, or they'll join the, the Trumpers or whoever it is. Right. So it's like Protagoras is the one who's actually perverting the meaning of words. But he's saying that's what the ordinary person does and he's using the words correctly. You if you disagree, you are a dog-faced baboon. <laughs> or a leftist or whatever. There you go. Yes. You're a socialist. All right. Right, right. <laughs> so Theodorus um, would end it here with saying, um, Socrates saying that his resources are small, but if Protagoras were alive, maybe he could give a better defense. And Theodorus says, you're joking, Socrates, for you have come to the man's assistance with all the valor of youth. Thank you, my friend. Tell me. Did you observe just now that Protagoras reproached us for addressing our words to a boy and said that we made the boy's timidity aid us in our argument against his doctrine, and that he called our procedure a mere display of wit, solemnly insisting upon the importance of the measure of all things, and urging us to treat his doctrine seriously? Of course, I observed it, Socrates. That was very clever of you to try to pull me back in. <laughs> well, then, shall we do as he says? Well, I guess I don't have any choice, so by all means. Now, you see that all of those present, except you and myself, are boys. So if we are to do as the man asks, you and I must question each other and make reply in order to show our serious attitude towards his doctrine. Then he cannot, at any rate, find fault with us on the ground that we examined his doctrine in a spirit of levity with mere boys. Why is this? Would not Theotetus follow an investigation better than many a man with a long beard? Yes, but not better than you, Theodorus. So you must not imagine that I, ha that I have to defend your deceased friend by any and every means, while you do nothing at all. But come, my good man, follow the discussion a little way, just until we can see whether, after all, you must be a measure in respect to diagrams, or whether all men are as sufficient unto themselves as you are in astronomy and the other sciences in which you are alleged to be superior. It is not easy, Socrates, for anyone to sit beside you and not be forced to give an account of himself. And it was foolish of me just now to say you would excuse me and would not oblige me as the Lacmandonians do, to strip. You seem to me to take rather after Skyron. And there's a note here, by the way, that Skyron was a mighty man who attacked all who came near him and threw them from a cliff. He was overcome by Theseus. Then Antaeus, a terrible giant, forced all passers-by to wrestle with him. He was invincible until Heracles crushed him in his arms. So these are references to mythology. And he says, you seem to me to take after Skyron, for the Lacomandonians tell people to go away or else strip, but you seem to me to play rather the role of Antaeus, for you do not let anyone go who approaches you until you have forced him to strip and wrestle with you in argument. Your comparison with Skyron and Antaeus pictures my compliment address. Admirably. <laughs> Only I am a more stubborn combatant than they. For many a Hercules and many a Theseus, strong men of words, have fallen in with me and belabored me mightily. But still, I do not desist. Such a terrible love of this kind of exercise has taken hold of me. So now, that it is your turn, do not refuse to try about with me. It will be good for both of us. I say no more. Lead on as you like. 
most assuredly I must endure whatsoever fate you spin for me and submit to interrogation. However, I shall not be able to leave myself in your hands beyond the point you propose. Remember earlier, he said just for a little while, let's argue. Even that is enough. And please be especially careful that we do not inadvertently give a playful turn to our argument and somebody reproach us again for it. Rest assured that I will try so far as in me lies. Let us therefore first take up the same question as before, and let us see whether we were right or wrong in being displeased and finding fault with the doctrine because it made each individual self-sufficient in wisdom. Protagoras granted that some persons excelled others in respect to the better and the worse, and these he said were wise, did he not? The last part was Socrates. Ah, so. ah sorry, sorry. <laughs> You're good. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> now, if he himself were present and could agree to this, Instead of our making the concession for him in our effort to help him, there would be no need of taking up the question again or of reinforcing his argument. But, as it is, perhaps it might be said that we have no authority to make the agreement for him. Therefore, it is better to make the agreement still clearer on this particular point, for it makes a good deal of difference whether it is so or not. That is true. Let us then get the agreement in as concise a form as possible, not through others, but from his own statement. How? In this way. He says, does he not, that which appears to each person really is to him to whom it appears. Yes, that is what he says. Well then, Protagoras, we also utter the opinions of a man, or rather, of all men, and we say that there is no one who does not think of himself wiser than others in some respects, and others wiser than himself in other respects. For instance, in times of greatest danger, when people are distressed in war or by diseases or at sea, they regard their commanders as gods and expect them to be their saviors, though they excel them in nothing except knowledge. And all the world of men is, I dare to say, full of people seeking teachers and rulers for themselves and the animals and for human activities. And, on the other hand, of people who consider themselves qualified to teach and qualified to rule. And in all these instances, we must say that men themselves believe that wisdom and ignorance exist in the world of men. Must we not? Yes, we must. And therefore, they think that wisdom is true thinking. Oh, that wisdom is true thinking and ignorance false opinion. Do they not? Yes, of course. And I think we should stop here because from here then Socrates is going to now counter those arguments of Protagoras's. So we see Socrates going back and forth, right? First, he gave the neutral presentation. He gave some refutation. He gave another defense today. And then next week, we're going to see him now tear it down again. And by talking about what wisdom is. And this is a very interesting conversation, so I think it would be best to stop here so that we can pick it up from the beginning of this leg of the conversation. But up to this point, what are your thoughts? The way he pulled Theodorus back into the arguments or what you see him embarking on now, what we've read so far. What are your thoughts? Jacob, I'll start with you. What are you thinking? Yeah, I wonder if Theodorus uh, really subscribes to to you know Protagoras's theory or not because of his like hesitance to you know defend his master. 
basically and you know having to be like roped in it um yeah you know he he tried to pass a lot i guess he does because he tried to pass it along to the uh theotetus because that's why theotetus thought it was like his idea was maybe because theodorus has like instilled it in him but uh yeah you know it's a, it's interesting hmm. Right. He did mention that he left his speculations early, right? And went into math. So he seems to be a person who's not very interested. He doesn't think about these issues deeply. Maybe he agrees with Protagoras, but in the way that a lot of people are, are spiritual or hold certain theories, they haven't thought deeply about them. They're not comfortable discussing them. Right. I, I right. find him relatable. I think most people are like this. Hmm. I agree. I, I am, you know, was like this before too. And, you know, really questioning my beliefs made me, hmm. you know, kind of gravitate towards Platonism. <laughs> yes. yeah. Jed, what are your thoughts? How exactly did he rope him back into the conversation? Well, let's go back and take a look. Oh, I don't need this highlighted here. Sorry. So actually, it was back here. Um, so he mentioned here that um, that one possible complaint that um, Protagoras might have is that Theotetus is just a young boy at this point. And so to treat the argument more seriously, it should be older men. And he says, um, now you see that all those present except you and, me, and myself are boys. So if we are to do as the man asks, you and I must question each other. And then he pulls him in also by um, pointing out that there are some areas where Theodorus um, stands out with his geometry and with his astronomy. Are all men sufficient unto themselves as you are in astronomy and the other sciences? And so that's another way to pull him in. That is interesting. So that first part we read, um, mm -hmm. now you see all those present except for you and myself are boys. So if we are to do as the man asks, you and I must question each other and make reply in order to show our serious attitude. And the previous part was about wit. So he, Socrates, gave a demonstration of what Protagoras would say. And in that he included, if you um, just go around poking holes in arguments, you're jesting. Number one, you're jesting. And number two, that's not virtuous. You should be presenting a serious attitude. So these two ideas, Socrates brought in himself and then used them to pivot Theodorus because he said, um, oh, by the way, you know how I just said we have to be serious and we can't just uh, be jesting? Well, then you and I better talk, right? So that's very clever. He he it's like a joke. He he brought in the the setup and then offered the punchline. So in one sense that's clever because in pres um that's that idea of doing dual function that philosophers tend to do a lot. Like earlier in the discussion we had Theodorus giving an well Plato presenting an example of uh Theotetus of an example where he brought things together into a unity. 
and it was specifically to do with irrational numbers, which might be doing a dual function in that wisdom might have some uh, something in that you could represent with irrational numbers. There is an incommensurability between, and that won't make sense to us now, but the idea of a philosopher doing dual function as Plato's writing in that example, Socrates seemed to be doing that too in his conversation. He's not just presenting an argument. He's not just presenting Pr uh, Protagoras's position. He's presenting Protagoras's position in a specific way that he knows he can use it to pivot Theodorus, draw him into the conversation, and therefore benefit him. He's not wasting... He's very... Uh, what's the word? He's not wasting his words. He's very efficient, and the examples he's picking are specific ones that will benefit his partner in in a profound way mm -hmm. that's reminds me of how um i don't want to get off the text but dreams often are stories that have that f um it's presenting a uh, a drama re characters from our present problems from our present uh characters from our past that are significant but doing so specifically to point out something that might help us if we are fortunate enough to have somebody with the art to unpack it for us. Mm -hmm. So there's yeah, that happening. Mm -hmm. Wait, well, I should, before I go on, does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Um, getting off topic, though, I don't want to go into dreams now. But mm -hmm. yeah, so this was like a very clever way to try to pull Theodorus in. I agree with you. Yeah, and he opened his speech of when he was speaking in the voice of Protagoras. He opened by saying, if somebody's argument is the same as what I would say, then it's a fair refute of me. But if it's not what I would say, if their answers are not as good as mine would be, because they're not as, like, it's just a young boy, so he's not answering well, then you're refuting the boy, you're not refuting me, Protagoras. So that was how this little speech started. And so... Yeah, so Socrates had that idea from the very beginning, and now we're seeing him using it. That's a good point. Wow, that is interesting. So his perception isn't uh, linear motion through time. He must have had this idea of the whole or of something that will happen later that he needs to do as part of his art or knowledge or wisdom. Maybe If that... you're assuming he had this plan in mind, we don't know because we're not in his head, so we don't right. know. If it just popped in his head as this is a way to pull him in. Right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Then there's the other yeah. idea of, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I just uh, on that, on that point love, like mm -hmm. why, why would Socrates want to draw Theodorus back into the conversation? Mm -hmm. And it's like, it seems that Theotetus has already been like, okay, <laughs> there, there's problems with this, with this theory, but like, because of, Theodorus's, you know, loyalty to his teacher, may, maybe he was not really convinced. So it's like, you know, kind of what you said, Jed, about like, you know, having unity, unity being like good. So he's like, yeah, I'm not going to let Theodorus get away with maybe still holding on to this belief. So I have to mm -hmm. rope him in somehow. So mm -hmm. I, don't know, I was thinking that during that talk. That last right, time. right. We got to think about what is the value of pulling Theodorus in. Is it for, does he want Theotetus to see this? Is it for Theotetus's benefit? Is it for Theodorus's benefit? Is it for both of their benefits? And so that's another question to think about. And maybe that's a good question to end on. Oh, well, hang on a second. I, 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 sorry, um, I took a pause in my reflection there. Um, hmm. The fact that he can do this, introduce the antecedent and then offer the consequence give the setup and then the punchline and it, for it to work I wonder if um, he his presentation of what uh, Protagoras would say has to be on point I think there's a quote um, uh, uh, if you know the man you'll know what he's, what he, he's likely to say like he has an understanding, well, he, he, 
I'm sort right. of it should ideally be correct, like accurate. So that if it's not presenting Protagoras accurately, then it's not a good presentation of him. Sure. Yeah, it wouldn't have worked. Mm -hmm. So he would have. Ha so Socrates has to have an understanding of the mind of Protagoras, uh, such that he could um, give an account of what he's going to say. And somebody who knows him really, really well, like Theodorus here, is going to say, "Yeah, that's right. That's what he would say. That's bang on." And I'm going to come back into it because, yeah, I don't want to do what my teachers would likely scold me for and <laughs> just be joking and, and talking to boys and um, not be being serious. So there's that element to Socrates functioning here to be able to grasp as the nature or the whole of the mind and the lo and the words that will follow from that way of thinking, mm. which is fascinating. Mm. And then there's one more point, which is the idea of um, uh, appealing to the love or the interest or the um, the, uh, the the strength of the person to rope them in. You're really good at geometry, aren't you? <laughs> oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's and I've noticed that in philosophical conversations that um, I think we've talked about it in the past. Like people who are interested in a certain thing or, or are like excited or they love a certain thing, meet them where they're at in terms of that. Like like you're saying, oh, I wasn't really interested in philosophy before. Maybe I went too far. I, I went too quickly into geometry. Mm -hmm. Well, he's, he's saying something. He's saying, I, I, I wasn't interested in that, but I'm really interested in geometry so much so that I maybe went to it too quickly. Well, if that's what you're interested in, let's go there. Hey, let's use it. Let's use what you're interested in. Mm -hmm. And exactly. I, I've met people like that who, who they say, oh, you know, what are you into? What are you into right now? Like, oh, I really like football. Oh, yeah, what's the best you've played? Like, oh, well, there was this one time. And then that state of mind or that way of thinking that I'm already excited about becomes the pivot point to draw me in, to get me focused, to get me interested. Yeah, so maybe that's part of it. I think so, yeah. Good point. Yes, exactly right. Socrates has this whole little bag of tricks. Huh? Yes. And I think we should stop it there, though. Um, it's getting late, so we should stop it there. And then next time, then, we're going to pick up from the same point here, and we're going to see um, an exchange then between Theodorus and Socrates, where now Socrates is going to poke some holes in the defense that he just gave. So he's just going back and forth here. Okay. So thank you very much. Those of you watching on YouTube, if you do have any questions or comments, you can put those in the comments section or you can drop me an email. And as always, if you enjoyed this, please hit the like button. It really does help the channel. And also if you don't already subscribe, please do so. You'll get notifications when there are new videos. And I hope you'll join us next week. Thank you very much.